All right. So welcome to the last professional development lunch talk of the semester. This week we went through something a little bit lighter. So we've invited several faculty members who have either regularly attended these lunch talks, lunch talks or, who have, or, or who are heavily involved in student focused roles, such as the faculty mentoring committee to talk about their stories. They have been given several prompt questions for inspiration based on questions you all have been asking throughout the semester on motivation, work-life balance, and just how they found their passion for their career. We're hoping this will not only inspire our students graduating this month, but also the rest of us who may have been struggling with motivation during this very strange, isolating time. They will each speak for a short time on whatever wisdom they would like to pass on to us, and there'll be plenty of time for any other questions afterwards. Uh, feel free to send me your questions to the anonymous question form that Kat just linked into the chat. Um, she'll be checking that throughout the, throughout the talk. And we're gonna start with Erhai because he has to jump off a little bit early. So if there's any particular questions for him, make sure you get them book while he is here or email him afterwards. So. Okay, thank you. A any questions? So I, I, first I apologize because I have a, a class at 12.30, I have to leave. So that's the reason I will go first, I, I guess. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> If no question, can I share my screen? Um, sure, let me, I, how do I let, I think I let everybody share it. Uh, oh, all participants, there it is. Okay, try now. Okay, all right. Can you guys see? Yes, we can see. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, if there's no question, I, I, I thought I may uh, say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the students uh, uh, ask me to, uh, you know, speak my mind regarding uh, uh, research. So uh, first, make a disclaimer. This is uh, from my very limited uh, experience. I will focus on uh, uh, grad students a little bit, and uh, hopefully, uh, it's uh, it's also helpful for our undergrad students uh, as well. Good. All right. So one question. Uh, uh, being asked is that, uh, how do you handle frustration or setbacks with your uh, research? I think, uh, you know, everybody has their um, uh, um, strategies to cope uh, uh, with this situation, right? Uh, from grad students or undergrad students to each uh, faculty who will talk of, uh, about, uh, you know, related issue later. So. Uh, I'm going to just throw out a bunch of ideas for your reference. So first of all, I would like to say that if you feel frustrated, it's not a really bad thing. It's probably a good thing because by research, I, uh, uh, genuine original research, that means you are dealing with a problem that has no solution. If it's being solved, there's no point for us to work on that, right? So most good problems, they are hard. And uh, if you feel frustrated, it means that that's a good problem. It's worthy of your effort to solve, right? And uh, uh, from your point of view, by solving it, uh, you're going to grow from this experience. You learn new stuff and you learn new tricks, techniques, strategies, and hopefully uh, all these experience will benefit you uh, later on when you solve the next problem. And the second is a trick that I am personally use as a theorist. Okay? And I always encourage my students to also uh, try that, is that uh, you, you, you have two, at least two problems at hand, okay? two projects. They could be related, could be unrelated. So if you have trouble with, uh, say, project A, and you absolutely going nowhere, and then you can just take a break and try B. But, and of course, if B doesn't work, come back to A. The new ideas or, um, you know, next time you may feel um, 
you get a better chance. And the third thing I would like to say that, uh, well, uh, suppose you're dealing with a tough one, okay? And this problem, it seems too big for you, right? And then, um, or it has a, you know, it, it has no obvious solution. Well, then you can ask related questions, derive the questions. <clears throat> it, either a smaller one, uh, somewhat related or loosely related. You, you go off the road to a nearby, uh, say, landscape and they investigate what's going on over here uh, and uh, what are going on over there, right? And then um, you may come to your supervisor and say, well, here's this problem not going, uh, uh, that's not going anywhere. Uh, well, uh, can, can we do a related problem? Right, and this technique doesn't work, and that technique seems more interesting because you did the homework, and you will have a, a good chance to convince your supervisor. Right, and the next thing I would like to say that it, it, you know, don't keep the problem for yourself. Talk to other people. So when I was a grad student, I benefited a lot talking. Uh, with postdocs and the senior grad students um, <clears throat> in our group. We had a large group and whenever I had problems, I just vent my problem to them. And uh, usually they will come back with very good advice how to proceed. Uh, and I find that very, very useful. And the five and the six down here, I think everybody knows, right? And uh, Sometimes you need to take a break. You think about totally different stuff, right? And uh, so <clears throat> to make a breakthrough, you need, you need to take a break. This seems like a lecture now. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I'm, I'm also asking, what, what do you tell your grad students? Well, this, th these are some of the things I, I tell them. And uh, some of them may seem weird, okay? <clears throat> so uh, sometimes students come to me and say, oh, well, I read this paper, it does not make sense to me at all. Well, don't feel too bad, right? Is, I will tell them it's not your fault. It's probably the author's fault, right? If the author, writes a, 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 a good paper and it really understands what, you know, what is going on and then it should be presented or explained clearly. <clears throat> Second is really an extreme point of view, okay? So I ask the students say, you know, just go to the extreme that assume that whatever you've done, right? either writing a code or you produce some data or analytic uh, uh, calculation, just try to be your worst uh, critic uh, uh, <clears throat> and assume that nothing is correct, okay? Now convince yourself that, no, that's not the case. Everything is correct, right? And, and if you are putting some work uh, uh, to, um, to uh, you know, try to convince yourself first, then it will, later on you will have a, a very easy time con convincing others. And the third one is related to the first one. So <clears throat> some, sometimes students uh, will come uh, to me and say, oh, here's the paper. And the, the paper says, uh, this paper says A, the other paper says B, and they don't agree. And that's, that actually happens uh, a lot, okay? So uh, you have to be very, very critical. A, a paper says A does not mean A is correct, right? So we, you know, I, you know, especially for beginning students, they just they worship the, uh, the paper. It's written there, it's a prestigious journal, it must be correct. It's, sometimes it's not. And so uh, uh, to think for yourself, uh, I recommend my students to, uh, to first you spend, uh, you know, block some time uh, out and uh, you, you need this big blocks of time. 
it, it cannot be choppy. Secondly, it's very good to, to talk to people. Uh, you, you can think for yourself, sometimes you need to uh, get the ideas back and forth uh, with another uh, person and discuss. Okay, that is very helpful. And that's what uh, I have. So questions, comments? Pat, I think you said you had some? Yes, we just got a question in the anonymous um, report form. So did you always feel like this was the right job or fit for you? If not, when did you stop feeling like you didn't belong or weren't going to be able to make it? And then um, <laughs> the, the person who submitted it provided some context. They said that they really want to go to grad school, yeah. but they didn't think about it until recently. And they're worried that like they're going to waste time on something that they're not cut out for. Well, that's a hard, uh, it's a good question, right? So I don't think I have all the uh, answers, uh, but for in my case, I, I think it's, I'm happy uh, uh, with uh, uh, my job. And the, the most important thing is that, um, you know, uh, doing research is really an adventure for me, right? It's, so it's, it's never boring. Every night there's archive papers coming out and sometimes you, you read it and you completely change your mind and you got too excited to sleep, right? So that I don't think it's, you know, any other job, I mean, probably a lot of other jobs, but I'm not aware of that can give you this sense of constant flurry of excitement and discovery. So I, that that is personally I enjoy and uh, and probably like uh, doing research and the, at a university is the perfect uh, spot for you know for that. So that does that help? Um, well, we don't know who submitted it, but <laughs> uh, we can always revisit the question later as well if anyone else from the panel wants to jump in. But I thought it was a good answer. Thank you. Um, I think we have one last one. Uh, what was your first big achievement? Oh, <laughs> okay. Good question. Um, What's well, all relative, right? The achievement. I think uh, it's really um, a kind of a confidence defining moment was in grad school. So I had a really, really hard problem at my hand. I, I can honestly say for two or three years, I didn't make any progress. They just, it was in the back of my mind all the time. And uh, I tried everything I could. And uh, so it didn't go anywhere. I got very frustrated, right? <laughs> so, uh, but you know, just unexpectedly, just answer came out, right? So you, you, um, and uh, that's the moment. Uh, I think it's the first time I felt that I really solved a non-trivial problem, and it just that at that from that moment on, uh, I think I gained some confidence. So that that for me is achievement, and right? by the paper or the. The result itself, if you placed in uh, physics, probably didn't amount uh, much. But uh, for me, it's really a, it's a struggle uh, between me and the problem, and I won. All right. Are there any more questions, or do you want to move on to the next person? Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> All right, so who wants to go next? I know you all teach and hate getting people that don't respond, so one of you talk. <laughs> Do. Um, so I will, I'll follow up on, I mean, a lot of what Erhai said, I, I agree with wholeheartedly. And one of the things that, you know, for me, working on being able to answer questions, you know, how do galaxies evolve? How do things, 
you know, in astronomy happen has been just fantastic. And I think his point about having multiple problems at a given time is really important. And it's part of the fun of it too, right? To explore a little bit beyond that main line of whatever it is you're trying to do. Some of us then go explore in other ways too the physics education research and some other things that I've done. One of the wonderful things about our job is having that flexibility and that ability to explore what's interesting. But it's also really important, both in terms of getting ideas for what you want to do next and how to pursue the problems you're pursuing. And if you run into trouble. Um, so things happen when I was a, uh, graduate or postdoc, I was working on a problem. Hold on. We can't hear you, Jessica. You can't hear me now? Oh, now we can. Oh, yeah. That's, the, as I said, the mute is doing some really strange things. It's got like this long delay. Anyway, I apologize. Um, so uh, where was I? So when I was a, as a postdoc, I was working on a problem we had proposed to, to do this project. And um, I was working with the scientific team that built one of the instruments for the cosmic origin spectrograph, which was gonna be put on the Hubble Space Telescope. This is actually a focus of the postdoctoral fellowship that I had gotten was to get a lot of the ground-based data to try to uh, explore this. And shortly after that, um, the space shuttle got destroyed on, on, as it came down on landing, which delayed the uh, installation of that instrument on Hubble for 10 years. So that's one of those cases where if you don't have some flexibility and other ideas sort of percolating and things that you might do, you run into trouble. So I went off and ended up working with the Spitzer Space Telescope and studying stars in dwarf galaxies as opposed to studying the gas around gas-rich galaxies. Related problems, interesting problems, but not the same ones. Um, you know, I feel like that again a little bit with the tragedy with my favorite telescope that I did all of my research as a, or a lar large part of my research as a graduate student with Arecibo collapsing. You know, a lot of the things that I've been working on and doing, I've been taking students there and been involved in projects there for years, right? No longer can happen. So that flexibility is important both in the creative process and because things do happen <laughs> and can derail. So. But it's also part of the fun of it. You know, we have so much flexibility, we can do so many different things. And that's probably the thing I've really enjoyed. And part of, and part of the answer to, you know, why knowing that you do this, if you enjoy those things, if you can find the problems that you like and want to tackle, um, then this is the right path, right? And that may not be true for everyone, but it certainly has been for me. So I will stop there and please ask questions. There are a lot of different topics. So <laughs> so we have one question. Um, what are your favorite parts about your job? Well, I, I think as I was saying, so a lot of it is that ability to pursue the questions that interest you, right? And to ask them and answer them. Um, work with students on them. I, I really enjoy that aspect as well. Um, that it's fun and, and again, that it can take you in so many different directions. And, you know, we don't have, unlike most jobs, right? Sort of the, you know, there are certain things we obviously have to do, but there's a lot of flexibility in that. Even, even the things we have to do with teaching, there's often a lot of flexibility in how we pursue it and which things that we teach um, research, we pick out the questions that, that draw us that we think are exciting and interesting and can make a difference, so. Okay, we have one more question. Um, so the student wrote, I know you've done a bunch of different things with policy, education, and astronomy research. 
How do you avoid getting stuck in a narrow research field? How do you keep so many opportunities open without getting overwhelmed? <laughs> That's a very good question. And, and it is a challenge. And honestly, it's one of the challenge. It's wonderful and right. It's sort of the, the great parts, but also sometimes the difficult parts about sort of the way I've pursued this stuff. Uh, as I said, you know, I've done a lot of different things. I started that fairly early on. Um, even as a graduate student, I was fairly involved in some teaching things that was more out of necessity. When my advisor didn't have funding for me, I became the head TA, that sort of thing. But um, even as a postdoc, I got the NSF fellowship, which had a big education component, and I really enjoyed that. And so I was balancing those two things. Uh, as I've always said, it's about figuring out in, in this career, there are certain things that sort of are required to, to sort of achieve what you want to achieve at various times and figuring out how to shift the balance based on that. So when I started as a tenure track faculty member, I put a lot of the education work sort of on hold for a while. It was a much, you know, I, not 100%, but mostly was not stuff I was working on at that time because I needed to really focus on getting the astronomy research up and going and building my group and doing all of those things. And that was the priority. And, you know, as I got tenure, I was able to shift back to doing more of that and actually building up that research as an area. You know, I took a break and went and did policy. Um, it does make me sometimes feel like I'm running in 10 different directions. So <laughs> it's not always easy, but I enjoy that. For me, that has been uh, a pleasure. I'm not the sort of person who wanted to just do exactly the same thing uh, forever. And some, for some people, just answering different questions in their field is enough. And that's great. And if that's you, that's fine. And one of the nice things, again, about this job is if that's you, that works too. But if you have these other interests, there are ways to do it. It does mean finding that balance over time and what sort of different stages allow is different. Um, but that's a Okay, and I promise this is the last question and then we'll move on and if there's more, we'll get to them at the end if we can. Um, do you have any advice for undergrad students wanting to get into science policy? Is grad school necessary for that? Uh, so no, grad school isn't necessary. I mean, there are some paths to science policy that flow directly through graduate school. So the fellowship that I was involved in, you needed to have gone to graduate school, gotten your degree. Um, but there are definitely ways to get involved. Many, most of the people involved in policy have not gone to science graduate school. And as a science student, you are certainly in a position to do that. And I'm happy to talk to people about how to look into those things and pursue it. We're in the, uh, we're in the process of putting together actually a minor in science policy here so that people can get some of that experience and it will include an internship. But we're also sort of trying to build resources and internship stuff for people interested in that it's so graduate school absolutely is not a requirement to do it um, but if you go the graduate school path there are ways to do it that way as well okay thank you um see uh, mike or karen do you want to go next um sure i can go if you want me to okay. so um yeah um Erhai and jessica have you know, made some good comments on uh, uh, on research and and grad school and and that kind of stuff. But I was going to just focus on the questions uh, that were in your email, um, which takes me back a long way. How did I find my passion for science? Okay, uh, that was one of your questions. Um, I was pretty lucky in that I found uh, that I just loved science when I was about six years old. Um, in particular astronomy, because my father got me a, a telescope. And uh, where I lived, the night sky was just incredibly beautiful, hundreds of miles away from big towns. And it was just, you know, at night you could see the, the Milky Way and it was just gorgeous. Um, I guess I need to give you a little bit of context. I grew up in, in the hills of Kentucky in a very um, poor uh, region uh, and with low, uh, education and low expectations for education. Uh, I'm, I'm technically a hillbilly. And um, so I, I, I didn't even meet a college graduate until I was in high school. 
So I didn't really have much of the way of mentors, but I was very lucky in hooking up with Carl Sagan. I just started writing letters to people and he was one of the people that responded to me and sent me some free books. And so um, I started reading his books and I started learning about astronomy and I found out that you could actually get a degree in it. And, and so everything else you know, just flowed from that. I knew very early um, that that's what I wanted to do. And also knew I wanted to teach because I was learning about stuff that my my siblings do nothing about, my parents do nothing about. My, my mother had a seventh grade education. My father got two years of high school before they had to quit and do work. So I was trying to explain to them why this was interesting. So I, I sort of became a teacher when I was young, you know, too. Um, in, in, in terms of um, your next question, next question, how do I stay motivated? I think that was kind of easy, talking to colleagues, um, you know, uh, before COVID, in, you know, in person, uh, especially at conferences and at meetings. Um, and if you can't go to conferences, read about the big picture discoveries um, and even teaching. I, I think teaching keeps me motivated uh, for, for, um, for my research. But um, talking with people at conferences, I think is, is by far the, the thing that, you know, uh, keeps new ideas coming. Every time I go to a meeting or a conference, I just come back with new things I want to try, you know, uh, new, new approaches, new projects, and it's a little overwhelming, but it's, it's just a great feeling. Um, I, I think uh, also is going, going to seminars, going to, to um, presentations, especially as a graduate student, is, is important to see that, you know, the world of science is really, really big. Uh, not to get you overwhelmed, but just to realize that you're contributing something to to um, uh, to the story of you know, like I tell my students, the story of the universe. Um, see, your last question: How do you set up a healthy work work life balance with the demands of the field? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I I mean, I when my wife and I got married, um, we we planned our our, our family and our careers, uh, you know, we had it written out and how things were going to go. And uh, for the first few years, I think that went fine. But after three kids and her career job changes and, and me working with NASA missions, I think all of our plans kind of went down the tubes, um, especially our you know, three children. You know, uh, two of our children were, were, you know, the pregnancies are really difficult. My wife almost died in our first pregnancy. And we, they've had health issues. Two of them have had health issues even to, to the present day. So I don't know how to to um, to plan out a, a work life balance. I think the, the best thing you can do is to try to balance what's a high priority, immediate thing, an urgent thing, which you have to do, but yet realize and balance that with things that are important but not urgent. Um, and it, that's true in your in your personal life and in your research. Um, and, and that's just incredibly hard to do. And you have to do it often. Like every day I, 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 I sit down, I make a list of what I need to do. And then I'll go down, I'll write, you know, what's number one, what's number two, what's number three. And I start crossing them off in, in that order, whether I, I want to do it or not. I, I try to do the most important things first. And, and I just have to say, it's really hard. Um, and and uh, just have to be flexible to realize that priorities can change. I mean, we all know that now with COVID. So, um, so that's your three questions. In terms of words of wisdom, I, I'm not sure I can add much to what Urhai said and, and Jessica said. Um, maybe just to, to, to realize that um, when you're doing science, it's easy to, to fool yourself. I, you know, as Feynman used to say, you know, the easiest person in the world to fool is yourself. Um, and and the, the, the way to deal with that is to try to make mistakes early when you're working on a problem. Tr you know, try to put a lot of effort and passion into it early to get a big sense of it, and make sure you're on the right track so that you make your mistakes early and you don't make them later on when you're you know, down the road and you've spent a lot of time on a project. But it's so easy to fool yourself with you know, the way you want you know, projects to go or the way you want an outcome to be. And, and most of the, the projects that you know, I've worked on have just you know, ended up surprising me the way they've gone. Um, the missions that, that I was project scientist for two instruments on the space shuttle in the 90s and, and the results looking back at the Earth's atmosphere, measuring 
the oxidation state and, and emissions from hydroxyl just changed the whole field. Nothing like what we expected. Uh, missions to Mars, missions to Jupiter, and then the New Horizons. Every time we're, 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 we're surprised at what we find. So it's, it's, it, you know, it, it's good to have a lot of humility in this field because you can fool yourself and nature has a way of surprising you at how things work out. So I don't have a lot beyond that to say. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, everybody has their own story and it's, uh, to me, it's kind of exciting that everybody's story is unique. Um, well, yeah, I will add one thing. And this is something I, I learned from Carl Sagan, um, especially when, um, I was in graduate school. I finally got a chance to meet him in, in uh, graduate school, and that was one of the highlights of my, my career. And I was talking to him about um, you know, difficulties and you know, balancing. Actually, it was about difficulties balancing you know, my personal life and the demands of you know, writing a PhD thesis and how frustrating it could be. And he, he said, Joe, just remember to be nice to the people around you. <laughs> he said, we're all stuck in this together. And um, um, you know, it, it just, it hurts you and it hurts everybody else if you're not nice to each other. I mean, just try to encourage and to, to help each other. And also he said that everybody has a, a, an, an interesting story, no matter what their background, everyone has a story that uh, uh, not just unique, but, but special that tells you something about, you know, the nature of humanity. So I'll stop, I'm, I'm not gonna go on. Um, anyhow, that's it. So we, we currently have two questions for you from the anonymous um, question forum. Sure. First one is, what are you most excited about for the future of astronomy? And what do you think we're going to discover with all of the new observatories over the next few decades? Well, I have no idea what we're gonna discover. Um, so that's an easy question. Again, I think we're gonna be surprised. I think we're gonna be astonished at what we find. What I'm most excited about is um, learning about planets and habitability and the origin of life. Um, the origin of life studies don't really make the press much these days. There's a lot of interest though in planetary habitability with the exoplanet research. But what we're finding, especially with the studies of the early earth is that the, the origin of life was a very robust process. As soon as the earth became cool enough so that life could originate, it was ubiquitous. And so whatever the process is, it's probably a robust process and we're gonna find it on lots of other planets. And so I, I suspect that discovering life on other worlds is gonna be you know, part of our near future. Could be totally wrong. Um, you know, like I said, it's easy to fool yourself. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't bet. I, I've never been a danger going to a casino because I know too much about statistics. But, but if I was forced to bet, I would bet that we're going to find uh, complexity at the level of life on Earth on many other planets. But it may be complexity be beyond what make up you and I. And it might not even fit our definitions of life. But, but you know, to give it a name, I bet we're going to find life in lots of places in the universe. Could be wrong. Um, and then our second question is, what is it like to work on a NASA mission? Oh my gosh. Um, I've, I've worked on, let's see, three rocket missions, two NASA shuttle missions, three uh, Earth orbiting missions, uh, and two deep space missions as co-investigators. And I've worked with data from many others, like a lot of other people. The, the biggest one was New Horizons. And... Um, it, that was funded in, in 2001. It actually, yesterday was our 20th anniversary of when we got notice from NASA that we were going to get the $800 million to build and launch New Horizons. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. I mean, it was something that was incredibly hard. I mean, it, but we believed we could do it. And so to be a part of that, you know, in, in planning it, uh, arguing for it, um, advocating for it with Congress, with, with the scientific community, and then with a decadal survey, and then to propose three times to NASA and have the whole program canceled twice, and then to finally get selected and make funding. And then you, then the work really begins. You got to, you know, build and, and, and test and, and 
and, and launch a mission. And we were, uh, I mean, it may sound strange, but when we launched the, the spacecraft to, to, to Pluto, we launched the spacecraft without an in, encounter sequence. I mean, the spacecraft didn't even have the instructions of what to do when it got to Pluto. So we had to, on, the, on its way to Pluto, we had to, to develop that encounter sequence that took years to do and then upload it to the spacecraft and, and test it with dry runs. And then, you know, it had a one shot deal. It had to be perfect or we waste $800 million. And, and then to get to Pluto and then two weeks before the encounter, the spacecraft went into safe mode, you know, just shut down. And we were just, you know, panicking, but the engineers were brilliant. They figured out the problem and uploaded a correction. We lost less than 1% of the data. And then this was in 2015, July of 2015. And, and I've, I've been a co-author or written like 40 papers since then. And I'll, I'm sure I'll be writing another hundred on the stuff that we discovered. I mean, just surprising. Um, none of the other missions I worked on were of, of that intensity or, or that duration. But all of them had those pieces to it. And so all of them had, you know, that, that excitement and that, that, um, that feeling of accomplishment and also that feeling of surprise at the end of, 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 of what you find. I've also been on missions that, that were canceled, um, where we lost out to other competition, you know, proposals where we didn't make it. I've, I've been on one mission that crashed you know, after many years of work. Um, so I've, I've seen that aspect of it too. So there's no one really answer to what it's like to work on a NASA mission. I mean, I was fortunate with New Horizons that we, we had a team that was just incredible. And, um, but it was 15 years, no, it was like 20 years of work before the spacecraft even got to, to Pluto with no scientific publications, with, you know, nothing to show for, you know, 20 years of work. Um, and, and it could have all, you know, just evaporated if it didn't, if the spacecraft didn't work right. So there's always a risk associated with the NASA mission as well. But I, I mean, so many different facets of, of that experience. If you ever get a chance to do it, if nothing else, just go to, to, to watch a launch of a spacecraft. I, I mean, it's an incredible thing. So that's all. All right, and just to make sure we have enough time, uh, Karen, are you ready? Yes, I am. Um, and I wanted to share something with you guys. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know how to do it in, in, I'll see if this works out. Share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah. See, see a picture? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question here, oh, this is the wrong one, there it goes. The question here is, um, this is a picture from Cooper Union uh, back in 1987. It's a summer program for high school students um, and Alan Wolf was the advisor. And the question is, who is the person who is uh, furthest from the instrumentation? And that person is right there and that person is me um, back in 1987 and I was thinking, about what it was like um, when, when I was younger um, and what it, how I led to where I am today. How did I go from being the furthest from the instrumentation to then having my own lab um, back down here at George Mason University since 2002? And I wasn't the kind of person uh, who, um, I feel like I wanna see you guys. Let me see if I can go back to, to stop sharing and see you guys better. There you go. Well, maybe you guys can show your faces a little bit. You don't have to, but I'd love it if you did. Anyway, how did I, how did I go from being the furthest from the instrumentation to actually actually um, working and doing instrumentation? And I wasn't one of those people whose parents gave science toys to. My parents weren't scientists. I was afraid of instrumentation. I was afraid of using my hands. And maybe you're the person that's a little bit off to the side too, and you're going, I don't, I don't know what to do. And how do you, how do you go from, from, from that to be doing instrumentation? I remember I went to undergraduate, and I took my first lab class, and I was incredibly uh, intimidated. I was with uh, two guys, and we were a threesome, and we were working, a, a, you know, on an oscilloscope together, 
And these guys obviously knew what they were doing. They had touched a scope before. They absolutely knew what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. And of course, so I didn't even get to touch the scope because I didn't know what I was doing. I was so frustrated. So I wanted to touch the scope, but there just wasn't an opportunity. People knew better than me. So um, what I finally found is that I needed to work my way into being the person who's in front of the scope. And I need to sort of say, okay, people know better than me, but I'm still going to go ahead and do it anyway. And I'm going to ask my questions. And I'm going to find partners who will let me touch the scope. <laughs> so sometimes that's important to find somebody who will let you uh, touch the scope. Hi, Kaya. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then, then that's nice. And so uh, the real nice experience came with a senior lab, which uh, and where I was, I got to be in a room by myself. And so when you're room by yourself and you have instrumentation, you can do what you like and you can truly experiment. And then eventually when I went to graduate school, I, I truly found what I liked is when you have a whole lab to yourself and then you can do goofy stuff and you can make mistakes and you can try out new things. And so that was my path from going to scared of touching the instrumentation to wanting to be the chief person in instrumentation and finally to, I don't want anybody else to touch the instrumentation, go away. So, so that, was my, um, that was my sort of road to it. Um, in terms of motivation, actually I, I, um, I talked to some of the students before this, uh, you know, to sort of also ask what their motivation was. And so some of these ideas are theirs ideas. Uh, uh, the most recent one was from the undergraduate, Kyle, who's working with me, he says, I'm most surprised that the research that I, the, all my studies that I've done are actually applicable, that they actually have a purpose, that they fit into something, that it works. And one of the things that makes me most sad when I talk about undergraduates, when they say something like, oh, you know, I, I, I did an experimental course and, you know, I did some experiments that didn't work. Well, you know what? The great thing that motivates me is that experiments work and that physics actually works. And that when you see something work out and you see the beauty of it, you're like, wow, that is so amazing. And so really the reason why I like doing physics is because it works. And so I'm sorry if you've had that experience, you know, maybe the instrumentation wasn't good or you didn't have enough time because the great part about physics is that it that it works and it's very applicable and all of your studies works and that's really neat too because sometimes you feel like you're just doing paperwork i'm doing paperwork i'm pushing a pencil on paper um but it's reality and so that's that's part of um what i what i see and then just that the world is beautiful i remember somebody asked me like what's your favorite project and i the answer really is whatever i'm working on at the moment that's my favorite project because it's the one i'm most interested in it's the one i'm thinking about um it's the one that i'm excited about so that was the, on the motivation side, um, you know, and, and please get your hands dirty. Oh, the other one is I had a quote, and I think I could just say it out loud. This is from Einstein without sharing it to you. A person who has never made a mistake, never tried anything new. So um, please, as a student, go ahead and make your mistakes. Raise your hand and be wrong. It means you're in the discussion and it's okay. It's part of the process. You know, get in, get into the instrumentation and do it wrong, and then do it right. So you you want to go ahead and make those mistakes. Um, so in terms of work life balance, you know, the question assumes that you found a healthy work life balance. I'm not sure we can really say that's true. Um, I can I can say a couple things. This is also actually from not from me. It's from somebody in my lab. Uh, in general, is that throw out your phone. So you need to be able to when you need to be able to work, take your phone put it away, put it far away, lock it away. It's the big distraction. You're not gonna be able to do good work if you have your phone. So you gotta put the phone away and focus and, and, and work as hard as you can during the time that you have. That's part of the work-life balance that you, when you're doing work that you get the work done and then you can do something else. Um, the other one that, this is also from a graduate student. Uh, he said, I don't know if it's exactly work-life balance, but he sort of said, in terms of frustration, and you've heard this from other one, is that try to take a big task and make it into smaller tasks or smaller projects. And so we've heard that from many people. And as an experimentalist, one of the things I've always liked is that, hey, if my experiment's not working, I'll go do some design or I'll do some theory or I'll do some computation. So I can basically have different modes, different pro not, not necessarily different projects, but different modes in the project because um, there's always lots of things to do there. Um, 
So if you find yourself to be in a, a, in a relationship where your partner also works, I suggest that you get housekeeping. You said work-life balance. Mm -hmm. That's one of the tricks. Get some housekeeping. Try to live close to your job. Make your commute short. Those are the kinds of things. Um, try to marry somebody who understands <laughs> about work-life balance. Um, those, are, those are some of the things that um, I would say about work-life balance. So that's about it. Pretty short. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Karen. Um, a question here for you. What skills were the most useful for you throughout your career? The, I think, I don't know if this is the skill, but I've always wanted things to be true. And so I've always been driven to try to make them true. So whether that's in an experimental or on paper or anything else, it's, it's not necessarily a skill, it's more of a mindset. It's a hard nose mindset too, because I, something like Erhai said, don't trust anybody over 30. You know, my motto is don't trust anybody. You know, don't trust the textbook, don't trust anybody. Just, I, I wanna know that it's true for myself for first principles. And when you have developed that mindset, then you find new things. I mean, sometimes you don't always, but sometimes you find new things and your understanding uh, becomes uh, very deeper. Um, and I guess along those lines, I would say for the undergraduates, um, when you have acquired your knowledge, this is not exactly skill set that you're even saying about either. When you acquire knowledge, then it's yours forever. So if you have to be a little bit obnoxious when you're acquiring that knowledge, or you have to be the person who raises your hand 10 times during a lecture or whatever it is, don't worry about it. Because at the end of the day, you have that knowledge and when you've got that knowledge, it's yours. And so again, it's not exactly skill sets that people are talking about, but I, I think those are the maybe the more important skill sets. Um, of course, I've always loved math. You know, you have to have math as your base language. And so I, I've always thought that that's a, a very necessary skill set. Um, but the search, for, the search for truth and the search for knowledge for yourself, I think, is the most important piece. So in these last 10 minutes or so, we wanted to touch again on a few questions that some of you have answered. Um, a lot of students tend to ask about imposter syndrome and work-life balance, and we appreciate the answers that we've already gotten, but we wanted to give an opportunity to the rest of the group who wasn't able to answer um, as far as imposter syndrome, um, it's regarding the first question that was submitted about whether you always felt like you were, like you had the right job or like if it felt like a good fit. And um, if it didn't, when did you stop feeling like you didn't belong and kind of think, I think I'm gonna be able to make it. Um, and then as far as work-life balance, just a general question, if you have any advice for future parents or folks who are serving as primary caregivers for family members. So anyone or all of you can take those questions. So I can I can clearly say, as you saw from my picture, there have definitely been times where I just didn't fit in um, and, and, and question whether I should be where I was. Sometimes I question now whether I should be where I am. But, um, you know, uh, 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 basically, um, like I, when I went to undergraduate, I was probably either one of maybe one or two women in a class and in graduate school is, percentage was about 10%. Um, and at Princeton, um, you'd walk down this hallway and they had all the Nobel Prize winners from Princeton and there's no women. So it was always like walking down this line of, of all male um, uh, physicists. Um, and so it's, it's really hard in those situations to not feel like you don't belong because you really just don't look like other people, but there's other ways of not feeling like you belong. I think to some degree, often most people don't feel like you belong. Um, you know, and I even took a year off between undergraduate and graduate school. But at the end of the day, it's about your motivation more, uh, more than about whether you belong or not. Like, do you wanna be doing what you're doing? Are you interested in it? Do you want to pursue it? Is it interesting to you um, more than trying to answer the question, when did I start to feel I belong? Because um, I think those, at least for me, those are still things that I struggle with. I 
I can see Jessica, your lips are moving, but we can't hear you. You still can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes. I don't know what is wrong with this thing. Okay, very short. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I would say the same thing that really for me fairly early on, I got the opportunity to do research and in doing that realized that it is what I love and enjoy doing it. Um, so that part of it wasn't the question. And certainly along the way, there were plenty of times that feeling like I might not succeed at this for any of a variety of reasons were always there and that, that self-doubt, but it wasn't as much in my case about, is this something I enjoy and want to do? It, there was certainly the, am I capable of doing it? Am I going to make it where I want to get to? Um, but, and I think that's where having the experience, getting the opportunity to do some research, if you have that opportunity, especially as an undergrad, it's incredibly valuable to see, is it what you love to do? Um, because I think that can make a huge difference when it becomes tough, because there are certainly times when it is. And it's about sort of, even when it's tough doing it because you love doing it. I'm not sure I can add a whole lot to that. I've, I've never, well, I guess there's only been one or two times in my life that I feel like I've been at a place where I really belonged, that I really fit in. Um, and, and one of those was in graduate school at, at Caltech. But in high school, um, uh, science was actually discouraged. Um, my um, high school uh, guidance counselor tried to talk me out of going to college and um, didn't believe my ACT scores, so just ignored them and uh, tried to get me to buy my uncle's farm and be a farmer. Um, but that's not what I wanted to do. And, and so many times I felt like I didn't belong starting very early. And so the, the thing I learned was do what you want to do no matter if, if other people appreciate it or like it, you know, do what's important. Um, and uh, I think I, that's kind of guided me throughout m pretty much all of my career. Um, uh, the sense of belonging is, is something you're just probably going to have to struggle with. But, but then again, you know, that's just my story. I've had to struggle with that a lot. In terms of the second question, I think about work-life balance and you was a, what question was primary caregiver or children? Um, oh, Jessica, are you talking? No, oh, okay. One of them is to connect with, at least for me, if you're, if you're a woman, connect with other female people because say when I knew I was gonna adopt children, I went to Jessica next door and said, hey, Jessica, who's a good person who I can hire for my children? And so then I put my child in the same daycare as, as her. And I took to another female professor and I said, well, I'm thinking of adopting and I'd like to take some time off, but I don't know how to do it. And she said, oh, I know what you should do. You should apply for the sabbatical. But I said, I don't know when adoption is going to come. And they said, no, no, just apply for sabbatical anyway. And then, you know, then you can then push it off. So, um, oh, yeah, she was right. That was a good idea. So, so connecting with other people who are going through the same thing as you can give you new ideas. Um, and so there are other people out there who have the same same issues. Now, if you really um, are in a situation where you can't do that much and you have to give that caregiving, um, the thing that was advised to me is to keep your finger in the pot, meaning always try to do something that's still in your field, even if for some period of time you have to give a significant amount to something else, like maybe take a temporary position. So any anything that keeps the trail going, because um, you know usually things change and then you can go from being a part-time to a, a full-time whatever. So that's that's what I would say in terms of, of those things. Thank you all. So uh, really quickly, one last question while we have a few more minutes. Um, some students wanted general advice on how to find either a good research group if they're going the grad school route or just a good career. So in your experiences, how have you been able to identify if the environment is a good fit for you? And like, how are you able to know if you think you'll be able to thrive in that setting? So um, the main thing I would say, it's really hard during COVID, but um, if you can visit the place and you get the, the students or, 
or the postdocs or the undergraduates, whatever is apart from the professors and you see how they are. <laughs> and you ask them, how's it going? <laughs> how's the research going? How do you like it here? Um, that's, that's the, you know, in terms of the, the, the fit in terms of what you are. And then also, um, I know everybody, the different researchers you've chosen are very different kinds of projects. Sometimes they're small little. And sometimes the question to ask is, well, what do you do all day? Do you, do you sit at that desk? Do you work in a lab? Do you work with a lot of people? Do you like working with a lot of people? Do you like working with a little amount of people? Sometimes you, don't cons you consider the topic more than you consider what it is that you like to do during a day. Um, so that's something to think about. And definitely talk to the students in the groups you're considering. And probably for any place, consider, you know, hopefully there are multiple people you'd consider working with because sometimes the person who does exactly what you think you wanna do is not the person you necessarily wanna work with. Um, so a little bit of sort of flexibility and exploration and you may find that, yeah, as Karen said, it's not always about the topic, it's about how does that work get done and what ways do you like to work, whether it's with lots of people, whether it's more hands-on or less so or whatever. Um, some of those other factors matter too. And it's by talking to people that you find out how, how things work. All right, and if that's it, we're at about one o'clock. So thank you all for coming and sharing your stories with us today. We really appreciate all of your advice and all of your honesty throughout all of this. I'd also like to thank all the attendees over the past semester since this was our first attempt at this talk series and I think it went pretty well. We're in the process of planning the schedule for next semester and beyond. If you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to either email Spectrum specifically or send it through any of the anonymous forms that are linked on the schedule. So have a good break, guys. Good. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see everybody. Bye, Karen. Bye. -bye.